Hello and welcome to Unit 3 or Part 3 for getting started in industrial cybersecurity. So I appreciate you for coming and uh, we'll go ahead and jump right in. This is actually going to be the monster section of the course. So if you can make it through all of this content, it should be all downhill after after this this section. But this definitely is is the the monster section of the entire course. So what we're going to cover in this section. One is we're going to walk through a real world example of a industrial control environment. So we're going to use a power plant. It was the first project that I was involved with on site. And so that's the one that's just always clicked with me. And I think it can be applicable to a lot of different folks, but just also keep in mind that it doesn't matter really what type of ICS or OT environment you're in, the basics of cybersecurity are the same throughout. So it doesn't matter if you're in a power plant or a chemical refinery or a subway or a mine or a hospital or et cetera. It's the, the basic concepts are, are the same. We just are going to customize them slightly for each unique environment. So we're going to talk about some industrial control uh, aspects of those projects from the engineering perspective. So we're going to talk about some terms like ISBL, OSBL, or inside battery limits, outside battery limits, and what that means. We're going to talk about greenfield and brownfield projects. Again, some terms that I've I've heard and was exposed to in whether it's you know, in my day job working for one of the world's largest engineering companies or just in other conversations with folks in industrial controls, cybersecurity. So I wanted to make sure we, we put those in here as well. And then we're going to get really into the, the meat of the section where it makes it look so simple here on the agenda. But looking at, we're going to talk about the different types of control systems. So if you're coming from an IT or IT cybersecurity background or you're not familiar with control systems at all, this is really hopefully the section that's going to mean the most. All right, we're going to talk about the different types of control systems and what they are and what do they do. So when we talk about what is a PLC or a programmable logic controller or what is an HMI or an RTU or ICS versus SCADA versus you know, we're going to get into the, the majority of the control systems that you're going to be exposed to and need to understand to have a, a basic understanding of control system cybersecurity. And then we're going to spend some time talking about industrial control protocols. And there's lots of industrial control protocols. And we talked, you know, in, in previous history, we had industrial control protocols that stood on their own and ran on their own networks in, in dedicated environments. And you can still see those today. And we'll talk about some of those examples. But most industrial control protocols that we're going to see in the real world have also been adapted to run over TCP IP since that's the one common protocol the vast majority of networks use today. And that's primarily because TCP IP is the protocol that we use to communicate over the internet. So we use it because it's everywhere, but it also gives us that inherent risk that there could be some type of connection out to the internet from the OT network that we're not aware of. So we're going to look at how TCP IP works, and we're going to talk about some of these different industrial control protocols that run over TCP IP or also as standalone versions. But we're mostly going to talk about Modbus, which is the most common version of industrial control protocol in use and used you know, being uh, transferred or transmitted over, over TCP IP. And then real quick, we'll, we'll wrap up the section with talking about learning to program control systems, particularly PLCs. So the whole idea of that programmable logic controller, well, we're going to talk about the programmable aspect. And this is one thing that's really, for me, it's really critical to understand, even just putting a few hours into learning how to program control systems and that closed or that closed loop or control loop we talked about in the last section and understanding how that's created. Right? It really helps bring into focus 
at least some aspects of control systems. And then that builds into having a better you know, understanding that big picture when it comes to how do we secure these environments. So that's what we're going to talk about in this section or in this part. So again, as I mentioned, really, as we go throughout this course, you know, I wanted to make sure we used a, a real world industrial control environment as an example that we could talk about. And so, again, as, as I mentioned, my mind always goes back to my first project that I ever went on site for. I used to start to talk with engineers about projects that you know, were in different parts of the world, and but I never got to go on site. And then finally, when I did, after I don't, probably about a year and a half or so, getting to go on site after talking with, with again, different engineers and even clients and, and others around the world, it was just amazing how it really brought everything into focus for me. And I think we can probably understand if we're just reading and talking about something, you know, we really don't truly understand when until we, we set foot like in that power plant that part of it was was actually energized and it was in the process of being commissioned so it, part of it was actually up and running and live which is really really exciting and and also realized right, it's a very dangerous environment so it's very exciting but it's also very dangerous at the same time and it really if anything ever before had talked about you know understanding the importance of safety and control system environments it, it was that site visit and realizing how dangerous these environments can be. So that's the example that we're going to use as we go throughout the course. So we're going to talk about this combined cycle natural gas power plant. And as you imagine, so the, the power plant brings in natural gas and uses that to uh, ultimately generate electricity. And we'll actually walk through that, that process and what that actually looks like. Before we get to that, I did want to mention the idea of an overall life cycle, in this case of a power plant, or really, again, there's the same concept for any industrial environment or any you know, really OT environment, even just a, kind of a standard manufacturing facility. So when we go to design and build right, a new facility, right? If I want to say I have a power company and I want to build a new power plant, so first we have to figure out where we're going to build the plant. Where can we build, right? Where we have to worry about local and and um, kind of the country or <laughs> the county county laws, and that might you know, prevent us from building in a specific place. The site has to be uh, physically compatible to with with being able to build the, the project there. We have to, so we have to find where we can actually literally build this thing in the dirt. We have to make sure that, like in the case of the the power plant that we're using in this example, we have to be close enough to where it makes sense, where it's feasible for us to bring in utilities like natural gas and probably electricity from another provider to get up and running. And so, and other resources, water is gonna also be an extremely important resource that we need to bring in to the site. So we have to make sure that we find a location that fits all these needs, right? That we can legally build in a power plant in that environment, right? It's probably not gonna be too close to the general public. We're gonna have to make sure that the land, the environment, right? We can we can purchase it and that it's going to be viable. It's going to be feasible to be able to construct a power plant there. And that we also have access to those resources that we're going to need to run the power plant itself. So there's a lot of things and that's just kind of scratching the surface, but those are some of the big items that we have to take into consideration when we're going to build a new facility. So as we're going through that, and, and some of these steps might happen at the same time. So in this case, a client like for ours, for us, will go out and hire a company like Floor to do front end engineering design or what we call feed or feed work. And so this is where we have the engineers and others on the teams will actually build out, if you want to think, the, the design or the schematics or the blueprints on what that power plant is actually going to look like 
and down to the you know, placement of the very last bolt down to its exact measurements. It's really amazing the, the work that engineering companies like Floor uh, actually do. Um, I'm just really, I'm still mind boggled, especially at the size and scope of some of the projects that, <laughs> that we have. But that's the idea of feet. So an engineering construction a lot, or an, engine, an, an engineering company like Floor will, will focus on feed work. Right, being able to do the engineering work. And, and for some engineering companies, that's all they do. They just design the facility. So Floor does more than that, and we'll get into that. So Floor is what we call an EPC, or engineering procurement and construction company, plus a whole lot of other things we throw in there. So, But again, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but we'll get to that. So, so we go through feed. So we have engineers and others that work on actually designing the facility. Now, as we're getting closer to, oh, we have a site, we know where we can build it, and that we're designing the facility itself, and that we need to go ahead and get the permits, right, with the appropriate governing bodies to make sure we can indeed build in that location that, that we've selected. And then, we get into this process of procurement and construction. So that's the, the PC of the EPC, which I mentioned. So floor is an engineering and procurement or construction and uh, procurement company, right? The idea is that procurement, we're going out through our supply chain to bring in the raw materials that we need or the materials that we need to build that facility like steel and concrete, control systems, right? wiring, et cetera. And then, of course, we have to build it. And some of these projects, they can take years to design, and they can take years to, to build, the, at least the large and sometimes what we call mega projects, so anything over a you know, billion dollars or usually like $500 million. It's considered a mega, mega project. And that's really the, the, the floor world um, of construction and, and engineering. And so we go through that process though of right, bringing in all of the resources that we need to build the facility, not even just all the, the supplies and the resources as far as the materials, but also the staff, right? the team members. We have to bring in uh, the equipment as well. So there's a lot that has to come into play to be able to build a facility, even if we're just building, a, say, a three-story office building, right? pretty standard, pretty cookie cutter. If somebody was building that today, there's still a lot that goes into building that. So once the site has been built, then it goes into testing, right? We want to make sure everything's up and running. So in that power plant, right, we want to make sure that the power plant can operate and operate safely so that we're not putting anybody in harm's way. And so we want to make sure then they talk about the different power plant or units at the at the site. So that first power plant that I was on site for, they actually had essentially basically three power plants in one. And so you would bring up one unit and test it and make sure everything's running and working appropriately. And then you would do the same thing with the second one and the third one. So once everything's tested, then you put the facility into production, right? which is what they call commissioning. And so that's usually where like a company like Floor, once we have designed and in this case built the, the site, that we turn over the keys to the owner. Right. So the asset operator or asset owner is like, okay, here's here's your site. And then sometimes we'll continue to work with the owner or whether it's maybe as the operators of that facility or in some other capacity, at least initially for probably the near future to be there to be able to support the client in case there were any issues. And then once the plant is up and running and it is in production, that's where we go into you know, operations and maintenance or we talk about O&M work. So we talked earlier about we have the operators of the site, which again could be the same company as the owners, could be somebody, you know, a completely different entity, but they're the ones responsible for running the site on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They're the ones that are staffing the people in the power plant that are ensuring that it stays up and running and is generating electricity. 
we have team members, like different technicians and analysts that do maintenance to make sure that we're keeping up in the facility to prevent things from breaking that would impact the availability of the site, which in this case, again, would, could impact our ability to generate electricity. And then over time, eventually, and it might be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, then that site is going to be no longer necessary, or at least it's lived its useful lifespan and it needs to go ahead and be turned off and decommissioned ultimately. So that's this idea of the overall life cycle of any, really any industrial site, but in this case, the power plant that we're going to use for the example. So is it absolutely necessary to understand this, to learn cybersecurity and ICS OT environments? No, of course not. But I thought it added a little bit background, which at least I find fascinating and interesting. Maybe that's just because of my background working at floor. But at the same time, I think, it, again, it just gives us a little bit more of that big picture that helps us understand, especially if you're coming from an IT or IT cybersecurity background. Again, just one more piece to help understand the entire big picture. So when we look at how does this plant work and i took this from there's a, a great video on youtube that talks about how these combined cycle natural gas power plants work but the idea is that the plant itself again the plant that i was at actually was three different power plants in in one but what we had was where you can bring into one of those units right if you want to think of it as one one power plant itself but you bring in natural gas into the power plant, right? And we're going to go ahead and, and it gets heated and able to turn a turbine and then that, that turbine in turn will turn a generator, which of course the generator is designed as it turns to create electricity. So we're bringing in natural gas, we heat it up, it turns a turbine that turbine is connected to a generator that it spins, and by spinning the generator, it creates electricity, and a lot of electricity. Now, many traditional power plants, that, that could be your, that's it, you're done. But what we've seen is that we can go ahead and create another, if you want, loop, or another circuit, where we go ahead and we take that exhaust off that first turbine and then we take that heat and we use it to heat water to create steam and then that steam in turn can turn a second turbine and of course that turbine just like the first is connected to its own generator and as that generator turns it generates its own electricity so we're actually getting a huge boost in the output of electricity that we're generating for you know less resources that we're bringing. So if we're already bringing in the resources to turn the first turbine and the first generator, well, let's create another circuit where it's worthwhile. I think it increases depending on the plant. You, let's say we, we get 50% electric generation off of that first turbine generator combination. You know, we might get 30%, let's say, off of that second one. But if it's not consuming, you know, 30% or 50% or another 100% in resources, we're like, why wouldn't we? And so that was the type of power plant that, that was my first on-site project. And again, when you look at, and some of these, you know, turbines and generators are massive. I remember standing in the, the room that you go into the room that stores the, the, the actual generator. And you're standing at, it's like four or five stories up and you can reach out and touch essentially the top of the generator i mean the generator is that large just massive but that's the idea when um, kind of think of a gas power plant and so there are some great videos on youtube here's some examples so here's you know the one i think i mentioned um, that we were just looking at and there, there's some other ones um, we're talking about thermal power plants there's nuclear power plants i think this is the one that was really interesting because you know, not a lot of us get to walk through nuclear power plants or you know we can kind of imagine uh, what they might look like 
But if you've never seen one or if you've never walked in or, or been inside a nuclear facility like that, I think it's really impressive. Again, it's just another piece of the overall big picture to help us just better understand that background and how to secure these environments and why it's important to secure these environments. I do like to talk about ISBL and OSBL. This is one that, these are some of those terms that I used to hear all the time where it was like, huh, what? Part of it was you know, we would hear them you know, because of my day job at Floor. And these are terms that, that get tossed around on projects all the time. But I also remember having you know, conversations outside of my day job and whether it's you know, going to SANS conferences or other classes with different engineers or just talking with you know, different folks on the side. My ISBL and OSBL would come up all the time. So I like to think of, you know, at a high level, the idea is that ISBL means this is all of the components, all of the systems that in our example, the power plant, right, that make up the power plant itself. So I mentioned the, the turbines, the generators. Right, the ability to, you know, the, the water itself, you know, running through the pipes that we're heating to generate steam, right? That's all within the plant itself. That's inside the battery limits. Right? Outside the battery limits is everything that's still on, the, on site for the power plant, right? But it's all of the resources on site that are used to run the power plant, that aren't the plant itself. <laughs> so, and this, give me a second. This is what will pop over to this picture that I took off of Google Maps of that the power plant that I had uh, been on site for. And so you can actually kind of see there are what, three different. Uh, I always want to say trains, but it's three different units when we talk about power plants. Uh, when you talk about uh, natural gas environments, we talk about trains. So, but there's three different plants in in one and so you can see anything within that yellow box roughly is that's the power plant itself those again all the systems that we use to generate electricity now we have you can see there's other aspects and other like buildings and components that are at the actual site itself from the parking lot to the security guard as you come into the control room to the water storage tank to water cooling stations to etc cetera, etc cetera. so we need all of those other resources like the control room and the water tank you know, to be able to run the power plant but they're not part of the plant itself Right? They're not required as part to run. They're not as part of the system that makes up the power plant. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> right. The overall, yes, we need those resources to allow the power plant to run, but they're brought in right, to the power plant to allow the pl power plant to run. Right. Their resources brought in to the plant to then be consumed or transformed into our ultimate output. Right? So we're bringing in things like water right? and oxygen, natural gas. Right? We're bringing those in from outside of the power plant. We're bringing in those resources to then create an output to then right, send back out. So that's the idea of inside and outside the battery limit, right? There's also this idea that the the kind of demarcation point between the two acts as a little safety barrier, almost like a DMZ. So the idea is that we shouldn't have any equipment within a certain area. You don't want to have uh, equipment, especially on the power plant side, that could be dangerous, that let's say it exploded accidentally that it would present a threat to anybody standing outside of the battery limits. And we can also use it as this idea, kind of again, going back to the DMZ of how we bring resources into the plant. And then let's say there was an issue in the plant, a safety issue. And so we can think of things like, well, let's turn off the water. Let's turn off the natural gas. Let's turn off the resources that we're feeding the plant that the plant then uses to consume to then create 
some other type of output. So again, that's ISBL versus OSBL. I think I did better in the last half than the first half. <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. I should have started with the picture. I think hopefully that makes more sense. Now we also hear of greenfield versus brownfield projects. And I, you know, when I heard these terms, I'm like, I think I know what they're talking about. And I, I did, I just didn't know, you know, 100%, I was guessing, but it, it's probably not that hard, right? Greenfield projects just means it's it's a brand new facility. I get to work in, I'm very spoiled in my work at Flora. I get to work in most greenfield environments. I, I get pulled into a project that we're just starting to talk about the feed work. Remember that front engineering and, and design work. So we're just talking about designing the facility. So that's the best time to be able to talk about things like how do we build cybersecurity into a facility? It's much different when we talk about trying to retrofit or build cybersecurity into brownfield environments. Brownfield environments or projects are those that have existed. And, and usually when they we talk about they've exist they've existed for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it's not just as easy as coming in and saying, well, let's deploy a firewall. Because we could literally bring the site down very quickly with a small change. Because you feel maybe some of those environments are really held together with, was it like gum and shoestrings or whatever the expression is. It's like a house of cards. You don't want to touch it in case you pull the wrong card and the whole thing comes crashing down. And when we talk about our primary concern is physical safety and then the safety of the environment and the availability of the environment, the plant itself. Then we start to really have considerations of how careful we need to be and how staged an approach needs to be when we implement cybersecurity in a brownfield environment that already exists. But that's the difference between greenfield and brownfield. So now we start to get into real meat and potatoes of the section. Another, I don't know, another weird American expression, sorry. And so when we talk about, we're going to look at the idea of the Purdue model. Now we're going to come back and talk about this, the Purdue model in the next part. So for now, we're really just trying to focus on the different parts or physical systems that we use to create a control system environment. So we're going to talk about things like field devices and you can see the list, right? And PLCs and all of the DCS and HMI and all the fun things we're going to talk about. So let's go ahead and jump in. So field devices, field devices operate at the lowest layer of, again, what we call the Purdue model. And so when we go back and in some of these, we started to touch on when you think about the previous you know, OT example of we used of you know, that thermostat you might have at home or in your office where it has a field device known as a sensor to sense or determine right how warm or cold right what the temperature is in in the room so we can bring in that information and there's different types of sensors and we talk about there's analog versus digital and there's whole other conversations that we have there. But for now, right, just understand we have things like sensors that we can use to bring in information into a control system, like the temperature, or you see humidity, or maybe I have a motion sensor right, to detect yeah, if somebody's maybe moving. And we have things like actuators. You can see valves, pumps, compressors, things that help us move systems and things out in the real world. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some examples of those. And then things like motors and the list goes on and on. But even just using our thermostat at home example, and the idea is, oh, it gets too warm. I want to be able to go ahead and turn on the air conditioning unit, which has its own essentially motor, right? Allows us to generate cooler air, push it through the, the venting and the duct system, and the room becomes cooler. 
So we'll spend some more time as we go throughout talking about field devices. But field devices is the one uh, aspect of any type of asset or part in a control system environment that is most overlooked from a cybersecurity perspective. I think the idea is somebody would physically have to be on site and be able to touch that sensor or an actuator to be able to make changes that could affect or impact the control system network. And not that's not always 100%, but I think that's the vast majority of the time. And so because a lot of people think, well, an attacker has to come into the environment and we have you know, our environment, it sits out in the middle of nowhere, or right, we have a chain link fence, we have security guards, so nobody's going to come and attack the, you know, the, the sensor that we have deployed out in the field. Hmm. Never say never. So we'll talk about, again, later on, some additional considerations for cybersecurity around field devices, because it's one of those areas that not a lot of people pay attention to. Partly because it's, I think in part, it's wrapped up with the whole physical security discussion, which I know we've already touched a little bit on in previous sections, and we'll touch, we'll talk more about it as we go on as well. So the first type of control system that we're really going to focus on is the PLC or the programmable logic controller. The idea is the PLC is the most common type of control system that is in use today. And there, there's some, there's different types of controllers. Uh, we're not, not going to get into those yet. We'll talk about a few as we go throughout later sections of the course, but for now, Keep in mind that the PLC is uh, the thermostat example that we were looking at earlier, right? So this idea is that the thermostat, right, or now a PLC, is it's just like another computer. I think I've mentioned that it, I know a lot of engineers that that don't like when I say that, <laughs> but for the most part, right, it has its its, its processor, it has memory. Um, I point that out because a lot of engineers don't think that PLCs are susceptible to cyber attacks, things like buffer overflows, where they are very much so, right? They have an operating system, a processor, memory, a code, right? So there's vulnerabilities, there's hardware and software there that we as an attacker could take advantage of. Now, PLCs, other control systems, don't have a lot of storage because remember the idea is that that our OT assets, our control systems, they're not processing a gigabyte Excel spreadsheets or large engineering AutoCAD drawings. Right? That's that's in the IT side of the house. In OT, we're running code, right, logic to bring in data from our inputs like sensors to then determine if we need to make changes out in the real world. And if we do, we, we send signals to make those changes happen. We continue to collect collect data and, and make adjustments over time as, as need be. And that's I say, that's all that control systems do, but that's all that control systems do. Yeah, at a fundamental level. So they don't the whole point is they don't need to store large amounts of data. Right? So we're not storing large amounts of data. We're not worried about storing large, uh, securing large amounts of data. Now you can find what they call ruggedized versions of PLCs that are designed physically to exist and reside in environments that have harsh conditions. So if you think if they're out in the field where they're exposed to extreme weather, right, extreme cold, extreme heat, uh, or maybe they're in an environment like a some type of desert type of environment where you, know, you have a lot of sand, right? How do it's like, how do we protect equipment against those types of extremes? Right? A, a normal, you know like computer or a network switch or firewall, right? you're not going to be able to put in those types of environments and have it live probably very long. So PLCs that are going to be out in an environment that are are exposed to extreme environments, then, then you are going to want to have those ruggedized um, versions. Now, we also talk about 
the PLCs, we program them. And so there are automation professionals, PLC programmers, then that's all they do, usually between programming PLCs and also HMIs, which we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit. So they always go go very well hand in hand, and hopefully you'll see that by the end of this, this section. So we do see that uh, that logic, that ladder logic is the programming language that we use most commonly still today. Now I have seen like on LinkedIn some different surveys and it looks like ladder logic is being phased out. There's, you know, I think five really main programming languages that we'll use for PLCs these days. And ladder logic does seem like it is being phased out potentially, but I know um, like at Floor in my day job, Ladder Logic is still going to be the most popular uh, language that we use for programming PLCs. All right, so that's the one that we're going to talk about in this course as as we go along. Right. Now, remember the idea of that thermostat. Right, we had that PLC, we have that system, that computer that has inputs and outputs. Remember, the inputs allow us to bring in data from things like sensors to be able to tell us yeah, what the temperature in the room is. Or you're going to see here, what if it's a not only maybe a maybe we're checking the temperature in a, like a data center, but also maybe the humidity. So we can bring that information in. And then we also, with the logic, right, we can make decisions based off of that information we bring in. And then if we have to make changes out in the real world, we'll send signals out the outputs. Right? So we'll send those, those signals. Remember, those changes are all based around when we talk about those set points. So we have that variable that we can set in the system or multiple variables. Right? In the example of the thermostat, right, we had that variable that we could set to, well, how hot or how cold do I want it? What do I want the temperature to be in the room? And then the logic handles everything from there because once it looks to, once it measures, well, how, what is the temperature in the room? Oh, it's too hot. Well, let's turn on the air conditioner. Oh, it's too cold. Let's turn on the heater, right? So it sends those signals down the output. So here's another way of looking at it. So I found this one diagram online, which I thought did a really, really nice job of showing, yeah, you know, we have, again, the PLC, which is very similar to another, another computer, right? Processor, memory has its own operating system, limited amount of storage, right? Not, not like an, a traditional IT asset. And then what does really make it stand apart is that it, the inputs and the outputs. Right, because we have those inputs that bring in sensor data in this case, like temperature, maybe humidity, and then we have that set point or those variables, right? So how, um, you know, what how what range of humidity do we need in the data center? What um, you know, what temperature does it need to be in the data center, right? So we can go ahead, and the PLC can then remember if it needs to make changes to the outside world, it can send signals out down those outputs. Now, in this case, what if it's not a thermostat, but this is a PLC sitting in a power plant? And so maybe I have this combustion chamber that I need to be able to send a signal to to ignite the combustion chamber to turn on, to create heat, right? And then use that heat to generate uh, or turn a turbine to then turn a generator to generate electricity. And then, or, and then maybe here is yeah, where we're unlocking or we're allowing the turbine to spin. So that's the idea of a PLC. And this is where, again, attackers get caught up. When they get into an environment, they might access that PLC and then see that it's connected to something. Right? But they don't know exactly what. So that's where they have to start reverse engineering the process data that they can see to try to understand what's connected on the other end. Is it an air conditioning? Is it a water pump? Is, is it a combustion chamber and a power plant? That's where we had that example that we talked about earlier where those, those hacktivists had accessed what they thought was a water treatment plant in, in Israel 
And instead of being this water treatment plant that, you know, provided clean drinking water to, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of people like they thought, it was a water treatment facility, which really was just kind of the, the, the pool cleaning apparatus at a, at a hotel, right, that cleaned and maintained their swimming pool. That's the main challenge for attackers, right? It's not getting into the OT network. It's not even gaining access to the PLCs or the HMIs that work in coordination with the PLCs to control these systems out in the real world. It's for them to understand, well, what are they connected to? What are they controlling? How do they control them? So we're going to walk through some examples of that as we go throughout the course. But again, for now, just think of that computer, that PLC, is, again, the thermostat. You could take that thermostat off the wall and use it to control something like part of a power plant because it really is that simple. Now, are you going to do it? No, the thermostat is not designed for that purpose, but hopefully you get the idea, right? Now, here's an example of ladder logic. We're going to come back and we're going to walk through a more real world example to actually show you, um, you kind of how ladder logic works. But I just want to get you this idea of, of kind of what it looks like. And so it's a structured approach to how we can program that logic in PLCs. I think SANS, I remember the first SANS course I went to, they did a really good job of highlighting how ladder logic worked. And they actually had. Um, the labs built around, right, doing some programming, which I thought was great. And that, and that for me, that was my first exposure to PLC programming back, you know, like 10 years ago. So we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about real world example. This, this isn't probably necessarily the greatest example for, for um, kind of learning ladder logic, but there are a couple of resources out there. There's a lot of resources. You know, I'm always focused on free resources. One is an online PLC. You can see simulator, so you can play with that. Um, so you can see that one. There's a few out there. That's the one I kind of liked. It seemed to have the most most functionality for me. So, And then I think I've mentioned before already the automation direct line of PLCs. So the click PLC uh, line. And that's the one of the PLCs that I have in my home lab. And so it's it's not only is it a fully functional PLC that you can use in control system environments. So I know engineers and PLC programmers and other automation professionals that that use those click PLCs. They're also the the PLCs that they use in the grid course at SAN, so the the course that Rob Lee teaches. Uh, but but. Also, it's the nice thing is you can get a fully loaded one brand new for like 400 bucks. You can't go out and buy a brand new Schneider or Siemens or Rockwell, etc. You know, PLC brand new, fully loaded for you know, probably anything less than you know, maybe $1,500 if you're lucky. And that's just getting getting started. So to get something fully loaded for like 400 bucks and very functional, very capable. I mean, it's they're they're a great great line of tools and so they have a a series a learning series that goes along with that so some of the videos are a little little dated at this point so they probably want to redo those uh, but otherwise um, it's a great resource it's and it's all again made available for free so if you want to especially if you're looking at getting real hands on you can go and buy one of their PLCs and even the, the low ones, right? Fully loaded 400 bucks. Low end you can you can get in for you know probably about a hundred or so US dollars we're talking about here. So still really incredible deal. Because if you really want to get start getting hands on experience in OT, the place to start is to get a PLC and start start learning the how to program PLC. You don't have to Becoming an expert in PLC programming, but at least getting some hands-on experience really helps you start to think and along, along the lines of, kind of again, thinking like an engineer, right? Thinking like an automation team member, right? How somebody from the OT side of the house thinks. So, another thing I wanted to mention 
before we move on from PLCs is that PLCs have a key switch. Now, sometimes on more expensive models, it's literally a physical key that you would insert into a key switch and, and turn. A lot of times, like on the Click PLCs, and, and I have some expensive uh, uh, Schneider and Siemens equipment. It's, it's just a, dip, a little dip switch, right? A little, little switch that you flip. The idea is that PLCs usually have at least two modes, one called program mode and one run mode generally. Or the idea is one is read-only mode and one is read-write mode. So that we can control when somebody can remotely update or even locally update the firmware and the programming of a PLC. Right? So from a cybersecurity perspective, if we have a PLC running in run mode, that's the read-only mode. It means the PLC is running, it's doing its job, and nobody can actually change, make changes to the PLC. The only way you can make changes to the PLC if it's in run mode is to change the key switch back to program mode. So if it's in program mode, the PLC will still do its job, it will still function, but you also have the ability to upload firmware, make changes to the code, etc. So that's the nice thing. It's a very simple concept on how we can secure PLCs from being hacked. Right? Because if they're in run mode, and if your attacker is remote, if they're not physically there at the PLC, as long as that PLC is in run mode, they can't remotely make changes to it. It's secure from that perspective. Now, if you have somebody make changes to a PLC, maybe they're doing an update in a maintenance window and updating firmware, or maybe they made an adjustment to the programming code on the PLC, and they forget to put the key switch back into run mode, that's where we get into trouble. Because if an attacker is in the environment, they find the PLC, and then they find that it's in run mode, then they could potentially make changes either you know, to the firmware or to the, the code running running on the, the system. But it's really that easy that we can protect PC PLCs if the key switch is over in read-only mode. If you have a physical key switch, then that's where you probably have to check it out. Maybe you have to go to a supervisor, they have the keys in a safe, and then they would actually check it out, and then they have a process to make sure did somebody return the key. And ideally, when they return the key, they made sure the PLC got turned back into run mode, right, before they were able to take out the key. Or then if you have the, again, the little dip switches, so it's not as secure, Right, to determine whether somebody has locked a key, like locked a PLC or not. So what you have to do is you have to have somebody walk and physically check PLCs from time to time to see if that switch is in run mode. Or there are some platforms, like the Dragos platform, has ability to check certain PLCs remotely to see, just to query to see, hey, are you in run mode or are you in program mode? That's actually what my thesis, my master's thesis is, is on, and actually basically creating an open source tool that allow people to remotely check PLCs to see if they're in red mode or not. I know it's nothing fancy, but it was what I could sell them on. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I'll take it. I wanted to do a much, much bigger paper on kind of the whole kind of risk, kind of threat landscape and the risk associated with PLCs and how all the different ways they could be attacked. But... Um, we'll go with the uh, PLC key switch security. <laughs> so, so more on that to come. Uh, and here's a quick picture I found. Oh, I don't have that. I think this actually came from the the Dragos research on the the blog posting that they did with um, PLCs and talking about the the key switch. So I talk about run mode versus program mode. Some PLCs I think I mentioned on the other slide have additional modes. I'm not a fan. Like one. It allows you to remotely configure the PLC to whether you can remotely make changes to it or not. You know, so the idea is I don't want to have to send people out into the field right, with keys or to flip dip switches because if it's a dangerous environment, I'm putting somebody physically in harm's way. 
I completely understand. But if we have a system that can remotely configure a PLC to whether it can be programmed or not, an attacker is going to find that system and they're going to use it against you. So it's one of those where the benefits are, especially again, if it's a very hostile, dangerous environment, then we're probably, we want to err on the side of caution, not put people in harm's way. So we would have some type of program that would allow us to do that. Uh, we were just talking about this actually for a project at the office this morning. Um, so in one where the environment is very, 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 very cold. So you would not survive, you know, out in the, the winter months for, for very long at all. So we don't want people, you know, outside in that type of weather. So, so in control systems, you'll hear mostly about PLCs or and sometimes more generically controllers. Well, and again, we'll we'll talk about some different types of controllers and PLCs as, as we go a little bit later on through the course. And then you'll also hear the term DCS. So for myself, you know, coming from an IT and IT security background, I look at this probably a little bit differently. And the idea is in a Windows environment, you know, with Windows systems, if you only have, if you have a very small business and you have a couple of computers, it's really easy just to manage those, let's say, three computers very individually, right? You can go and create user accounts and passwords on each one. Maybe you do some system hardening and you create some policies. So it's, it's not too hard to set those up on each machine, right? You do it three times. But what if you're like Floor and you have 35,000 workstations, right? That's not something that you want to set up and control on a machine by machine basis. So we set up or use tools like Active Directory to manage all of those systems centrally. So that's how I think of the DCS world. Now there's different types of systems when we talk about DCS that we'll get into some variations as we go throughout the course as as well but i think of you know if i have a in this case you know, that going back to the power plant environment and let's say just looking at part of that power plant some of the the major components or physical systems that we have in the real world are remember the combustion chamber that we can use to generate heat right the heat that turns the turbine and in turn, the turbine turns the generator to generate electricity. So in this example, let's just say we have a PLC that is responsible for controlling each of, of those physical systems that we have in the real world. So PLC number one, again, we're going to use it to control the combustion chamber. So we're mixing oxygen and natural gas to a specific uh, mixture so that way we can then ignite it, right? We take that heat, we use it to turn the turbine, right? We can have that turbine controlled by a second PLC, and then that turbine turns that generator, which is controlled by a third PLC, right? And ultimately, we get electricity. So again, very s simple example, but let's say we have a PLC for each of these types of uh, systems out in the real world. So I can manage each of those individually. But what if, and if we go back to the power plant example that we were using earlier, and we actually had three different power plants at that location or three different power units, if you want. So in this case, so each of those units, or if you want each of the power plants within the power plant, we can take those three PLCs and we can tie them into their own controller. So we can use that controller to manage each of those individual PLCs. And then ultimately we could tie those controllers back in this hierarchy back to kind of this the idea of the, the main DCS. So we have overall this DCS system, this distributed system to be able to control all of these different physical systems, these processes that we have in the real world. So again, for now, I again, this is just how I think of it is we can manage it PLCs individually, or we can do it in this collective or the centralized process using a distributed hierarchy or 
the DCS. So again, we'll talk about some more examples as we go throughout the course. So this is just a again, kind of a high level example of how Mike looks at it. <laughs> so again, we'll we'll uh, we'll see some more examples. We'll talk about some real world examples as we go on. So we also talk about SCADA. So we talked or we touched on SCADA a little bit earlier when we talked about how we define ICS versus SCADA. Remember, that was one of the things I remember Rob Lee mentioning that you know, ICS is LAN and SCADA is WAN. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, yeah, that makes complete sense. Where just so many people, myself included, or at least you know, maybe I shouldn't speak for others, but I know myself, it just, I don't know, ICS and SCADA, it was you know, 10, 15 years ago the terms were used in a way that could be very confusing and, and you couldn't determine the differences. And so when he said that, it was like, oh my gosh, I wish somebody had told me that before. <laughs> but when we talk about SCADA, and this is where we'll come back and talk about, you know, we have the ability to remotely monitor a control system or asset at a remote site. So the most common example we use is in power transmission. So if I am gener or not only generating electricity, but what if we're transmitting the power over long distances? We'll have substations that are responsible for monitoring the power over over distances, right? As we're transmitting it. And when Sorry, I just thought something. We'll go, we'll go back to that. So we have these substations, right? And the substations could be miles away. And so we're going to connect to those over some type of wide area connection. So you might have a cellular device or maybe satellite. A lot of times, especially in the United States, you'll see cellular connections. And that cellular connection is connected to what they call an RTU. And then that RTU gives us kind of that interface into other control assets at that location as well. So we'll go over the wire to connect to that RTU, which then also allows us to connect to other devices like PLCs and controllers that are at that substation. And there's other special types of devices like IEDs that we'll see there. Not the bad type of IEDs, but we'll talk about those in a minute. So the idea with supervisory control, we have the visibility that we've talked about, right, where we can reach out and we can pull data back, the telemetry on how that system and the systems that it's connected to, how they're operating. So we can bring that information back. We can display it to an operator like in something like an HMI. And then remember that HMI also gives us the ability to control that process remotely. So if there's an issue, maybe we have an alert or an alarm that we need to respond to, we can do that through our tools. But remember, SCADA is doing that over the wide area link. If we're sitting in the operation center and we're monitoring and controlling assets and pro the process at that same location, let's say we're in the, the operation center or the control room for the power plant, we're on site, then that's ICS. If we're remotely monitoring, let's say that remote substation, we're going out over, let's say that cellular connection to remotely monitor and control systems in the process at that substation, that's SCADA. Now the HMI, which we just had mentioned and we hadn't really got to yet, is with the HMI, the idea is it's a graphical interface. Now, a lot of people joke, a lot of times they have a very like 80, 90s look and feel to them. They look like, you know, some of the original websites that we had when the internet or when the World Wide Web first started. Uh, and this mostly because they're very stripped down. They don't have a lot of additional features or components. They're not running things like JavaScript, which is good because we don't want all of those additional components that are going to introduce vulnerabilities. There already are actually quite a significant number of vulnerabilities associated with HMIs, which we're going to talk about. So the idea, though, is we have this graphical interface right, that, again, very simple, very straight down, straight, <laughs> slimmed down, and that it gives the operator, right, it gives the human, 
the visibility into the process to see what's going on. So we can look at in a simple picture, oh, here's some type of air conditioning uh, system. Right? We can see some of the data that's collected by different sensors and have it displayed. We can see, oh, in this case, all the lights are green, which could be good. It depends on the environment. Sometimes good, green is good, sometimes red is good, believe it or not. So it just depends on the environment. And that the HMI also gives the operator or the control aspect. So we have buttons we can push. So we can push stop or start or turn them off, or we can push one, two, three, four, five. Now looking at the screen, we don't know what one, two, three, four, five does. So that would be something that the operators would know. Or if I'm a attacker, well, I need to figure out what one, two, three, four, five does. And those are the, I know when the attackers get onto these systems, it's where they, they slow down because they have to figure out what are all these things. But the HMI is going to be a really popular target for attackers because the HMI right, not only gives us visibility into the process of the PLC or other systems that are connected to it, but almost always a PLC, but then also it gives the person using the HMI the ability to control the PLC, which in turn right, allows us to control the process, right, the physical systems that it's connected to. So it gives us the visibility, it gives us the control. And when I look at it from an attacker perspective, or if I'm a penetration tester and I'm getting paid to play the role of attacker in the environment, the idea with HMIs is a lot of HMIs these days, it runs Windows. But it's not a traditional like workstation, laptop, or server. So a lot of people don't think about patching it. It's like printers in the IT world. Printers are just other Windows or Linux machines typically, but how often do printers get patched? Not, not too often, unless you have an automated uh, cloud service usually that does it for you, which is like what we have at Floor. So are we patching our HMIs? Because if I'm an attacker and I get in the environment and I scan for hosts and I find, oh, there's a, a Windows machine, and then, oh, it's running probably a web service because that interface can be drawn as a web page. So not only do I see a Windows machine that's probably not that up to date on its patches, so it could be vulnerable, could be extremely vulnerable to attack. It also is running a web service like built-in IIS in Windows, the Internet Information Server, or maybe it has another web service that's been added to it, whether it's Apache or you might say something like Light HTTPD or any of these other one-off types of browsers. So those probably haven't been updated. And then remember, this is actually drawn as a web page. So the web page itself can have vulnerabilities. So you have the, the operating system, you have the web server itself, and then you have the web page that's actually running on the web service. All three of those can have vulnerabilities that could allow an attacker to gain control over that asset. The other interesting thing is, let's say I do take control over the HMI and then I use it to attack other systems like the PLC that it's connected to. If I did set off some type of alarm that if the environment is watching for suspicious activity and there is an analyst that sees that event or that alarm, and then they look to see, oh, it's an HMI sending traffic to a PLC. It's gonna say, oh, that's that's just regular traffic. It's it's an HMI, nobody, you know, it's, it's not an attack. It can't be, it's an HMI. Just like going back to our IT example, it's a printer. Because if I'm an attacker, I want on the printer because if I'm using it to attack the rest of the network, if an analyst sees that alert, they say, oh, it's just a printer. Nobody can use it to attack the rest of the network, but they can because right? it's just another Windows machine, just like a laptop or a server or a workstation. So that's why HMIs are one of the top targets for attackers because it's kind of easy to, to hide. It's probably easy to take control over the HMI, and then once you have access, think of what it gives you, right? You have that visibility into the process, right? You can 
use that to reverse engineer what's going on. You can use it to see what's going on, right? We have the visibility and it gives us the control. It ha gives us the ability to manipulate that PLC and the systems, the process that it's connected to, that it controls. So the HMI is an extremely important asset that we need to protect because it is going to be a top target for attackers. So that's the, the idea of an HMI. Now, here's another example. Now, this is one I found on the Internet. It took about 10 seconds through Shodan. And we're going to come back in, in, I think, Unit 6 or 7, Part 7. We're going to come back and talk about using Shodan to find exposed OT assets on the Internet, right? Finding control systems like PLCs and HMIs that are exposed to the Internet. Because there's still still some out there. Not as bad as, as we were but, but there are still some out there. So again, um, you know, they're very, you know, talk about primary targets for attackers, especially anything connected to the internet. In this example, you can see, oh, here's an HMI for, it looks like a, a, a pump in somebody's well, whether it's for a house, maybe it's for an office building. I have one of these for my house in, in South Carolina. So the idea is I'm not on city water. It's not piped in. I just have a pump that's dropped into the ground right, under the water table and it brings up water and, and pumps it into the house. Now, when you see these exposed to the internet, sometimes they actually could be exposed to where you could interact with the interface and you would be able to push the buttons if you want to make changes. A lot of times they're, they're exposed to the internet in a read-only fashion, so at least the owners and operators in those cases were thinking a little bit when they were exposing those assets or those you know, the, the control systems to the internet. We still don't want it exposed regardless well, in any way, shape, or form. But at least if it's exposed and read-only, it, you know, at least they're not giving the attackers the ability to remotely control it. You're still giving them visibility, but you're not giving them the ability for control unless they're able to hack the interface and then bypass the read-only access. So we'll come back and talk about that because a lot of times, too, they're exposed through basically a second device, which then enforces the read-only. So again, we'll come back and, and talk about that, especially when we get into the, the Shodan section, which is going to be in Unit 7. But that's HMIs. Now, the SIS, the Safety Instrumented System, in a OT environment, this is the fail-safe backup. This is the most important system that we have in the environment, period, the end. Because not only is it designed to keep the facility safe, but we're keeping the facility safe not just for availability reasons, but ultimately to protect human life. Right? We want to keep our on-site personnel safe. We want to keep, if there's general public in the area of that facility, we want to make sure that they are safe. But the idea is with the SIS is that it monitors the entire plant. And if there's ever a fault condition detected, that could result in, yes, something bad happening to the plant, where maybe it just we're just worried about the plant essentially breaking down to where we have to take it offline to fix it. But again, most importantly, if there's ever any condition that could lead to, let's say, a type of explosion that would, would kill somebody, or maybe a gas leak that could uh, kill somebody. So the idea is that the SIS, if it ever detects that there's some type of fault that could lead to some type of dangerous situation, it can shut down part or the entire plant to keep it safe. Or we talked about in the second part about the Trisis incident where the Russian nation state had come in over the wire, had control over the Saudi Aramco petrochemical facility, and they're in there for three years. And in that time, they reverse engineered the OT network and the processes and were able to remotely access the SIS and take 99.99% .99 control over it. 
And then once you, if you had a hundred percent control over the trisis, right. And you can, I remember, I think there's, there's quite a few course articles about trisis out there and, and all of them feature Rob Lee. And in most of them, you can see he'll rattle off 10 different ways an attacker could create an explosion in that environment very quickly. And he always, again, stresses that this idea and why an attacker would want to take over the SIS is so that they're going to kill people. Or again, I always think, well, they're going to create some type of explosion or other, some type of other dangerous condition that's going to you know, potentially destroy the facility, which, of course, if somebody is on site, they're going to be killed. So you can understand how important it is to protect the SIS. So we take additional steps to protect it, like putting it on its own network segment, completely air gap or if you want to island it, so that it's not connected to anything else. So if an attacker was going to take control over the SIS, they would physically have to be on site. That's the only way you can really even start to protect the SIS to where you can trust it to do its job. Looks like this slide's out of order. So, but we did, talked about this in the HMI section, right? right. So, so we'll move on. Uh, now, there's the engineering workstation, right? The engineering workstation, whether it's a you know, like a physical workstation or a laptop, that we can use to be in the environment to do things like program PLCs. Now. If it's a workstation, right, the workstation is usually sitting in some type like a, a room or area designated for engineers to work. A lot of times it's off of the control room or the, the, the operation center, could be in the data center. But the idea is that yeah, you have a workstation and you'll sit there and it, of course it's not mobile, right, but you'll be connecting to the PLC that you're going to make changes to over the wire, right, over typically TCP IP. If you have a laptop, you could physically go to the PLC, which I think is actually what's happening in this case. Right? You have somebody sitting there with a laptop, and I think this looks like the maybe a serial cable. It could be an Ethernet cable that's being used to connect the laptop to a PLC up here. This is another picture you can see, by the way, that I found on the, the subreddit for the PLC subreddit. So lots of, lots of interesting pictures. So you can use again, the workstation or laptop to connect to a PLC to do things like upgrade firmware and, and make changes to code. Of course, if it's a laptop, there are a lot more security considerations to take into, con well, into consideration because right, that laptop could be taken off-site. It could be then at that point, you know, you, you don't know what <laughs> could happen with that laptop. You can have additional security controls on it, sure, like things like EDR to help protect it. But we have to have a heightened sense of, you know, security around our laptops, especially those laptops that we're using to do things like operations and maintenance tasks. So just something to think about, but also think about you know, from an attacker perspective, what do we get if we gained access to an engineering workstation? Well, then we would have you know, access to programming data, right? The code that we're running. So if I'm worried about, as an attacker, trying to reverse engineer a process or what's going on in the environment, then there's nothing better than have access to that engineering workstation or laptop right, that has that programming data, which we're going to come back and talk about later on, on it. So we can access that information and use it to reverse engineer the environment to understand what's going on. So that's the idea of engineering workstations or laptop. You see EWS all the time. I remember seeing EWS and it was like, what the heck? And then it was like, oh, engineering workstation. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And then it was like, oh, it's just another Windows machine. <laughs> Like, okay, I get that. 
And then data historian. For me, the data historian is going to be the most popular target for an attacker. And we'll, we'll talk about why. But the idea is data historian, it stores the, what we call the process data from the OT environment. So remember, we have the process in the OT environment of you know, what that environment produces. Okay, so if I'm the power plant and I'm producing electricity, or if I'm the insulin manufacturing plant and I am creating insulin injections. So we have process data that explains different aspects of that process, like how many injections of insulin did we generate today? How much power did we generate today? What resources were consumed to generate those things? Right, those are just some examples of process data that we can store. And we'll come back and we'll talk about some detailed examples later on. But for now, I think we have this data that talks about or describes what's going on in the plant or in the site. We're going to put it in a regular old database, like something sitting there in Microsoft SQL Server, sitting on a Windows Server, and that's what we call a data historian. Right? It's storing that process data for historical purposes. I think the, the big use for that is we take that data, we take that process data from the OT network, and we push it out to the OT, the, sorry, the IT network where the business is, where they can use that to do things like bill customers or coordinate shipping logistics. When I mentioned earlier that it's going to be the number one attack target for either attackers or penetration testers, and part of that is if, imagine, remember, most of our attacks in OT come from the IT network. So if I'm an attacker and I get into your IT network, which we know is going to happen, right? It's only a matter of time. If you allow the IT network to talk with the OT network, more than likely there's a DMZ between IT and OT. And that the one host, if there's any host that's exposed between IT and OT that's sitting in that DMZ, is a data historian. And that data historian, remember, it's just another Windows server running Microsoft SQL Server, which SQL Server has its own vulnerabilities on top of the operating system, which has its own vulnerabilities. So it's going to be one of those easier to attack targets and it's going to be exposed so it makes it an easy target for attackers so hopefully we'll come back what well, we will come back in the next part and talk about secure network architecture and how we can prevent it from being exposed but that's the idea of the data historian and we'll come back and talk more about process data and, and tags and so on in a little bit and here we're just talking about the process data right so we're going to record all this information about what's going on in the environment and we can we can use that for security purposes potentially but mostly it's getting that data into the hands of the business so they can make certain decisions or they can take certain actions and then you can also use or examine that data to identify issues with operations. Or maybe I can watch the process over time to determine things like predictive analytics to determine when certain parts in my assets are going to break down over time. So I want to know, oh, this part's going to break in, in three months. So we need to make sure that on our maintenance schedule, sometime between now and the next three months, we replace that part. That's another example of how we can use process data. And again, you could use it to find potentially uh, security issues in the environment, but that's typically not its use. It's for making business decisions on the IT side of the house, and then also potentially using it to identify operation issues that we need to be aware of. So here's an example of a operation monitoring sim. Uh, center. This is one for you see Enel is a green green power energy company in place South America, and so they have put place 
you know, put this out on the internet. So I thought it was great to be able to, to share with everybody. Cause yeah, this looks like a kind of, you know, typical, maybe medium sized uh, operation center or control room. And basically, right. We have the ability for, for control operators to sit, right. And watch screens filled with HMIs. And it looks like maybe an Excel spreadsheet in that lower left hand corner. And you see some other screens that they're using to monitor different aspects of the environment and be aware of different different aspects that they need to be. But mostly it's a collection of HMIs, right, that give us visibility and control. Allows us to see what's going on with the process, allows us to see what's going on in the plant. We can monitor for alerts and alarms. And then it gives us the ability to control. Remember, we can go ahead and we can interact. We can make changes to that process in the, the physical world if we need to react. So again, I thought that was just a, a nice, simple example of a, a control room I could share. Now, there are a lot of other different types of control systems. And we'll, we'll talk about some of these. Right, we already started mentioning RTUs in, in SCADA. We mentioned those IEDs, which are responsible for monitoring what's going on in, in power transmission, right? making sure that the power is being um, carried across the wire appropriately. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other ones like VFDs and VSATs and um, talk about MESs a lot. MESs are kind of the bane of my existence. <laughs> from a secure network architecture perspective, but we'll talk about that in, in the next part. So again, there are a lot of different types of control systems. Again, we're not going to get into all the technical details of all of these, but but we'll talk about you know a few of these as we go throughout the rest of the course. And then as you get into different types of environments, you'll find that um, you know, you'll definitely want to learn about you know, those control systems that are specific to your, your unique type of OT environment. I mean, if you're in manufacturing, you want to know everything you can about manufacturing execution systems. You probably do not care about intelligence electronic devices, which are essentially just for power transmission. And vice versa. If you're in power transmission, you want to know everything about IEDs and you don't really care about the meses of the world. So again, we'll, we'll talk about some of the more common ones and, and some of the examples, especially in power, because we're, we're focused on using power as our example. But, but we'll, again, we'll talk about some of these and the other ones definitely encourage you to, to look them up as you come across them. And, you know, it only takes a couple minutes, right, of reading to then understand. It's like, oh, okay, like, that's what VSAT is. Like, okay, that, you know, that makes complete sense. So we're moving into the last half of this section. I, I did warn everybody this was <laughs> this was going to be the biggest part or section in in the course. But so the first half we talk about the different types of control systems. That's what we primarily focused on there. And then in this last half we're going to talk about networking. So we we are going to talk about different industrial control protocols. But before we get there, we're going to cover some networking basics. So if you're from the IT side of the house and, and have a good grasp on networking essentials, then this next part of the section is, is going to be um, boring <laughs> for you. Uh, if you're coming from an OT background or or from IT and, and don't have a, a strong background in, in networking, then then hopefully this will be a great uh, introduction or, or maybe a refresher for some people. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the idea is when we network computers together, especially now we have, whether it's computers talking over the internet or Think in an OT network where we have different types of systems. So we have control systems like PLCs and HMIs and RTUs and SIS and DCS and, and the list goes on. And we also have Windows machines, you know, laptops and workstations and servers. And the idea is that we can allow different systems with different hardware, with different software, like different operating systems, so Windows versus Linux and all the different versions of those, right? we can allow these different 
operating systems and different pieces of hardware to communicate and share information and and also think of all the different applications that we run and not only on we think of like servers and workstations and laptops, but our phones and our smart TVs and our IoT devices, and the list goes on and on. So any device that is networked, especially if there's internet connectivity, right? The idea is that originally when computers like Xerox, Intel, Digital, or, or DEC had started to network their computers together, they wanted to be able to network uh, the different companies together, right? That would be really excited, exciting. But they realized there was no basis for communication between their own individual networks that they had created kind of in a, in a, um, in, in kind of their own, own little world. And so there was this need for a common framework. And as long as you wrote or created hardware and wrote software and operating systems to play by these seven rules, then those systems could communicate with each other. Even again, if they're completely different platforms. So these are the seven rules of networking that if, again, if you play by these, your, your system can talk with other systems. So we talk about the seven layers, and they're they're numbered one through seven, you know, with starting at the the lowest level, the physical layer. So level one is the physical layer. That's so we we talk about. This is where the zeros and ones, right, the the bits of data that are transmitted over some some type of pathway, right? Whether it's you have an Ethernet cable, or maybe it's Wi-Fi, like 802.11. But the idea is that you have that physical path that you're sending your data on, right? Zeros and ones, where there's either the presence of electricity or not at a specific point in time. Zeros and ones, that's, that's all we're sending over the network when we're sending data. Now, when you think that if I'm sending information over that network, over that wire or that Wi-Fi connection, right? To allow my computer to do that, I have to have a network card. And so the network card, operates at the data link layer. So the data link layer itself is actually broken into sub two sub layers. So there's the logical link control layer, and then there's the media access control sub layer. So the Mac sub layer is where the network card lives. So if you're familiar with the Mac address that's assigned to every network card, remember every network interface card has a 48 bit unique address to identify it uniquely from every other host on that, that, that subnet or that network. So the Mac sublayer is where the network card lives, right? the network interface. The LLC, the logical link control, that's where we have the software driver that allows the rest of the operating system to talk with and access and use the network card. Right, so the physical layer, layer, level one, and then the first part of the data link layer, right, that's all physical hardware. Right? We have, again, the network card that allows us to then connect into either Wi-Fi or uh, Ethernet connection, right, to have a cable connected. The LLC is the software driver that allows us to work with or interface with the network card from the operating system perspective. So everything else from the network layer up, right, if we're looking at it from a like a workstation or server perspective, right, this is all operating system. So at the network layer, this is where the IP of TCP IP comes in. So when we talk about the internet protocol, this is where, especially in particular, addressing and routing come into place. So every host on a IP network has to have a unique IP address. If you don't, you're going to have drop packets or missed deliveries, and you're not going to have you're going to have failed communication. It's just like if the delivery person for the post office comes to your street, and let's say you live at 574, but if there's another house across the street with the same number 574, they won't know who to deliver to. So they might just guess and go to one rather than the other. And it, it makes up for a mess. 
So we have to make sure that every system on the local network has a unique IP address from all other hosts. Otherwise, we have communication issues. And then you can see there, yes, we're, there's different versions of IP version 4. We typically see IP or IP, there's different versions. So there's IP version 4, which is 32 bit addresses, and there's version 6, which is 128 bits. Out on the public internet, essentially, we ran out of IP version 4 addresses a long time ago. So we want to use IP version 6, where we have billions and billions of, billions of, of, of IP addresses that will never run out of. So, they, so they say, right? Uh, never say never. But it's it's really you know, ugly to work with. IP version four is not necessarily the prettiest thing, but it's a lot simpler than working with IP version six for a lot of people. So it's very slow to very very slow to be adopted. So when especially you're in a, an environment like a OT network you'll see IP version 6 addresses. The only time you usually see IP version 6, at least for me, when I see IP version 6 in an OT network is because there's Windows machines that automatically start with IP version 6 addresses now. And so usually most of your Windows machines have both IP version 6 and IP version 4 IP addresses. So, which is which is not a good thing because attackers know and work with IP version 6 much better than, than most cybersecurity defenders and, and network administrators. <laughs> so, so a lot of attackers, when they get in environments, they can use IP version six to move about the environment and they might not ever be detected because a lot of defenders aren't looking for the IP version six traffic. They might not even know IP version six traffic is there, but it's there by default in newer Windows operating systems. So. But so IP addressing takes place in network at the network layer at level at level three. We also talk about routing. So if you're going to move from one subnet or one network to another, you're going to pass through a router. Right? That happens because of the addressing scheme. So especially think of if I'm going out to the internet, I'm passing through a router or a default gateway to get to uh, different resources out on the internet. And the, the the internet is just a collection of all these different IP networks that are connected with, with routers. So the network layer gives us the internet and all this internet or interconnectivity between networks. Now, when two computers want to talk to each other, they also not only need an IP address to reach that destination, like the delivery person coming to your home, but let's say they want to actually come inside and drop off the package. So the idea is to make a connection to a remote computer. We also use a transport protocol. So the transport protocol are, we're going to have two choices. So there's TCP and there's UDP. I don't have them listed here. So TCP is the one that I think most people are familiar with. And it's a connection-oriented protocol. And we'll come back and talk about the differences between them a little bit later on. Whereas UDP is a connection list protocol. But the idea is the transport layer is responsible for taking large chunks of data and breaking it down into these equally sized chunks that we put out on the wire, which eventually really get remember, chunked down into zeros and ones. But overall, we're logically taking these larger chunks of data and breaking them down into these equally sized chunks to send out on the wire. And we do that because it's much more efficient to send that data. So it makes it faster. But that's where TCP and UDP live. So when we talk about making a connection to a remote port on a destination system like i'm going to tcp 80 or tcp 443 to browse a website right that's happening at the transport layer with tcp now the session layer is where we establish the session logically between two systems so it's very important <laughs> but not a ton to talk about there the presentation layer is where we would see things like encryption and and compression, we talk data manipulation, right? Happening with the zeros and ones or the chunks of data that we're sending over the network. Though realistically, a lot of that functionality is now moved up into upper layers or it's even handled in applications. 
that are running on the system, not the application layer itself. So the application layer or layer seven, it's not, again, the applications running on top of the operating system, even though I have pictures of Word and different browsers here. But the idea, it's the APIs or, or the layer that allows applications running on the operating system to talk with the networking layers. That allows an application like a web browser to send a request out over the network, out over the internet to a web server somewhere on the other side of the planet to then get a response back and then display a web page for us sitting in front of our computer. We also talk about application layer protocols, like we're just talking about HTTP and HTTPS, which are used for web browsing or FTP for file transfers or SMTP, which we use for email. Again, the idea is we have these seven different layers or these seven different rules. So as long as you create your hardware or you write your software and operating systems to play by these seven rules, then it doesn't matter what hardware or software you're using. It doesn't, we're vendor agnostic. As long as we play by the rules, we can connect and we can exchange and share information. And we won't spend a lot of time on it, but what it looks like in this idea of data encapsulation is, let's say I do want to go out to, even just going out to google.com to load the, the main search page. You know, our browser is going to go ahead and take that request and pass it off onto the application layer, right? The data of the, the request itself. So get this web page, www.google.com. And it goes through each of the layers. And as it goes through each layer, layer there's a header. There's header data that's added that represents that layer. And as we go through each of those layers of the OSI model, that header information is added until we get all the way down to the data link layer, right? Where we're actually, remember the, the sub, the Mac layer, where our network card is, where we're taking the packet. We're also adding what they call the CRC or the cyclic redundancy check, which is essentially a hash or fingerprint of the data to make sure, especially when the data is transmitted over the network that the receiving computer can check the CRC to make sure that the data did not become corrupted during transmission. So much more important in the older days when we didn't have such reliable networks. But we take the data, right? We create all the header information by adding a piece from each layer. We add that cyclic redundancy check, put the packet out on the wire, so that way it gets sent over to our destination, right? There's our zeros and ones. And then the, desti the destination receives the packet and then it passes it back up the, its own OSI layer, which then, remember, we check the CRC, make sure, oh, okay, we got the packet intact. If it showed up as corrupted, we could request that it be resent, but it's going to be, let's say, we got the packet intact. And so then we pass the packet up the OSI layer, stripping off that header information for each appropriate layer because it tells the system how to process that data. So as we go up the data link layer, right, we strip off the data link header information. We go up to the network layer, we strip off the network header information, and so on and so forth till we eventually get the data, in this case, to the web server to say, hey, we want to see www.google.com. And so then the web server says, oh, okay, well, I'll get you www.google.com. Here you go. And then we go through the exact reverse order. So back down the OSI model, put those zeros and ones out on the network, come back to our computer, come back up with the OSI model, right? strip off all the header information until we get the web page. So when we want to troubleshoot network connectivity issues, we can use a packet sniffer to capture that network traffic, the zeros and ones, but then it translates those zeros and ones into information that we can understand and use for troubleshooting purposes on the, on the screen. So 
So we're going to talk about Wireshark, which is the most popular packet sniffer out there because it's open source and it's so powerful and it's free. So why wouldn't you use it, right? But you can use packet sniffers like Wireshark and there are a few others out there, but, but Wireshark is the most popular one to be able to do packet analysis. So there's different types of activities we can use packet sniffers for. So we mentioned one of those would be troubleshooting network connectivity issues. I remember the, the first day I was on the power plant uh, on site, they were using Wireshark to troubleshoot uh, Wi-Fi connectivity issues. So I was able to, to, to help out a little bit there. We can also use it to understand or establish a network baseline, which means we want to watch, especially in an OT environment, we want to see which assets exist in the environment and which assets are talking to each other. And when they talk to each other, well, what are they saying? And that allows us, if we create that network baseline, to then over time understand when something out of the ordinary happens. And if, when something out of the ordinary happens, it could potentially be a security issue. Maybe not. Maybe not. But it could be. So that's why we want to create these network baselines to understand what common functionality and communication in an OT network looks like. We can also use it and we're going to come back and in later sections talk about how do we create an asset register if we don't have one. So one of those options is to take packet captures in the environment and start with, well, what IP addresses do we see talking? And go from there. And then again, we can use it for troubleshooting network issues. So we'll actually look through some different examples of, of all of these as we go throughout the course. But again, we mentioned that, um, oh, and sorry, before I jump ahead, that you know we can use tools like Wireshark, right, again, for asset discovery, right, finding systems. Oh, there's an IP address we didn't know about, or maybe there's a MAC address. Maybe it's not running TCP IP. Maybe it's running some other protocol, but oh, we can see a MAC address for a network interface card. We can also use that to potentially map out things like operating systems or applications that are running on systems, which we could also then potentially use to map out vulnerabilities. And then again, ultimately from a network security monitoring perspective, we can look for anything out of the ordinary, right? That suspicious activity. You see the picture, I was trying to get somebody with a magnifying glass looking over, right, finding finding the, the malicious network traffic. Midjourney came up with two magnifying glasses, so I, I just went with it. <laughs> That's where that came from, though. All right, so Wireshark, I mentioned, again, it's the, it's the most popular packet uh, sniffer out there because not only is it open source and it's free, but that it's extremely powerful. So you can see we have over 3,000 what they call dissectors or parsers, right? It allows Wireshark to interpret over 3,000 different network protocols, which is a ton, which includes our most common protocols like, sure, TCP IP, and then also industrial protocols like Modbus, which we're going to spend most of our time in this course when we talk about protocols, we're going to be focused on Modbus. But also S7, DMP3, BACnet, uh, OPC, OPC UA, so on, and wireless versions as well. So not only 802.11, but we can talk about things like Zigbee, which I always love to say, and wireless heart, and um, you know, the, the list goes on and, and on. So we're going to be able to, we'll look at some examples of, of some of those. So you can download it at Wireshark.org. But Wireshark was created by Gerald Combs. You see, he actually worked at an ISP, and he wanted a packet sniffer to troubleshoot some network connectivity issue. But he went to look at them, and they were tens of thousands of, of dollars. And they didn't have the money to, to purchase a, a packet sniffer or packet analyzer. So he decided he was going to build one himself. I mean, just amazing. And then it created this tool that, I mean, if you work in IT and if you've ever troubleshoot troubleshot <laughs> network connectivity issues, you can use Wireshark. Wireshark is also a great security tool for defenders and for attackers. 
And it's a great tool, even if you're learning how different types of attack tools work. The best way to understand how the tool works is to watch it. What's going on behind the scenes? So if you're running a tool, let's say like Nmap, what's really happening when you're running an Nmap scan? That's how you can really truly understand what those tools are doing. Ed Scotus at Sands, I remember that was one of the things he always preached. I mean, he's preached that for 20 plus years. Run a packet sniffer in the background like Wireshark while you're running those tools to understand what's happening. What's really going on behind the scenes? And I actually had pointed that out to one of the, the ICS SANS instructors because the book was not correct. Because it's like, oh no, if you watched it through Wireshark, when you run MAP with the switches that they were recommending, it did not do what they said. I don't know if they actually ever updated that the book or not. I never went back and checked. <laughs> but that was actually because of, of Ed. But that's Wireshark. All right. So we talk about you know capturing, or sometimes you use the term sniffing, or sometimes you hear like passive sniffing of packets. Right? The idea is that we have those zeros and ones going over the network. And so I'll have a workstation. Now a workstation or any device, especially in TCP IP, right, it's designed only to pay attention to those packets that are specifically sent to it. And, so, and there's different types of traffic that we're not covering here, but whether it's unicast, so it's going directly to your system. We have other types of traffic like multicast and broadcast that go, like broadcast go to all systems. So your system would also listen to those those uh, broadcast. But the idea is by default, your system is not going to listen to all packets on the wire that it can see. It's only looking for the things that are addressed to it. So you can, if you have administrative access, you can put your network card into what they call promiscuous mode. And so if I'm running a tool like Wireshark, I put the network card into promiscuous mode. It does allow me to see all of the network packets, the zeros and ones, on the wire, whether they're addressed to my computer or not. And so we're able to see the zeros and ones. And then remember, the beauty of Wireshark is it takes those zeros and ones and put it, puts it into an interface that we can see and that we can essentially read and understand what's going on. Now, it might still look really, really, really strange at first, but if you've been doing it for a while, or even for a little while, you can start to get pretty familiar, I think fairly quickly with it, to do some basic troubleshooting and understand what's going on. So we'll, we'll look at some examples. And here's, so this is, this is more of a IT example, but I thought it was, it was one where again, we're capturing zeros and ones off the network. And we're allowing Wireshark to do that translation. And it's telling us, hey, what we captured here in these zeros and ones, this is NTP traffic or the network time protocol. So the network time protocol is used to synchronize clocks, particularly, especially in IT environments. Now, clock synchronization is very, very important in OT networks, undoubtedly. But we might not leave it up to just regular, old, ordinary NTP. Right? So, but... So in IT environments, we'll have NTP, and we can see things like IP addresses. We can see clock times. We can see you know, timestamps. So we could use this to understand what's going on with the NTP protocol between these two computers that are talking. We would also see things like IP addresses talking to each other. Um, it, we're just not seeing it in the screen. But we can use that, again, for troubleshooting to understand what's going on. And so that's just an example of how it takes these zeros and ones and translates into something that we can see and use better for troubleshooting purposes. So again, we'll come back and we'll see some great examples as we go through the rest of the section. So now we talked about in every network environment pretty much these days, the main protocol is TCP IP. And that's mostly because in some way, shape or form, almost all networks are connected to the internet. And the protocol that we use for communication over the internet is TCP IP. 
if the internet had been based off of, I don't know, the mic protocol, then the mic protocol would be the most popular <laughs> protocol in use today, right? Everybody wants to be connected to the internet. We even, even have a lot of OT environments that want to be connected to the, the internet for things like the industrial internet of things, which we're going to come back and talk about later. So there are industrial control protocols. Now, there were versions of these that ran on their own, and they didn't, you know, you didn't have TCP, right? You just had Modbus was the protocol that you used to communicate and share information between systems. Or S7, which is a Siemens proprietary protocol, or OPC, which is still a scary protocol, which, which we'll talk about. But, or, you know, the idea with OPC, it, it literally is built off of the same system that Microsoft uses called Olay, or Object Linking Embedding, which allows you to take data from one Microsoft application like Word or Excel and then post it into like a PowerPoint presentation. That's the same system that they use for industrial control. I was like, what? <laughs> Mind boggling. And I've never met an engineer that actually likes working with OPC. Now, OPC UA is a new standard or new protocol, which which is which is much cleaner, which might which is much nicer. And we'll see an example when we get into the vulnerability management part where there's actually a new uh, vulnerability scanner looking for vulnerabilities just specific to OPC UA servers. So I wanted to include that into the vulnerability management section, which I thought was very cool. So, and there's also wireless uh, different industrial control protocols as well. And, and we have, you know, we still use you know, things like 802.11, right? Just regular old Wi-Fi, but there are wireless, you know, specific wireless industrial control protocols like Zigbee and and wireless heart, and and you can see, you still use things like Bluetooth as well. So we'll talk a little bit more of those and and some examples as we go throughout the course. So again, we're going to focus on Mod, Mod, Modbus in this course, and we're going to look at the version of one of the versions of Modbus that runs over TCP IP. So there are some great GitHub repositories out on the internet for uh, industrial control and in learning cybersecurity and in OT. One of them is this, the ITI repository or you can see from Tim Yardley. And I mean there's a ton that he has in this GitHub repository. But why I really love it is that he has this PCAPS uh, folder or repository where he has you know, all of not only these different packet captures for industrial control protocols, but they're very small captures with just exactly very specific types of traffic. So you can really narrow in on the different types of traffic that you want to load into Wireshark and examine further. As I you know, love, the, love the collection. So we're going to use one of those packet captures for the course. So I mentioned we're going to focus on Modbus since it's the most commonly used control system protocol that we see. Again, it's a version that runs over TCP IP. Uh, and you can see, so Modbus was created by Modicon, which eventually got bought by Schneider Electric. Uh, but it was used, and you can see, over serial communication, like RS-232 cables, kind of like the, the cables that you, you might have seen connecting like a UPS to a... Uh, like a server <laughs> um, and or we use them to connect from maybe an engineering workstation to a, a PLC right for programming but uh, so we run it over TCP IP now you see the default port is TCP 502 so when we're looking at a packet capture if we see traffic to or from TCP 502 or if we do a packet scan of a a remote system and we see TCP 502 open, more than likely it's Modbus that we're looking at, a version of Modbus. There's, can, there's many different versions of Modbus, um, but uh, 
again, we're going to focus on one of the versions that runs over TCP IP. For me, it works just like SNMP, which we mostly see in the IT world. So if you're familiar with SNMP or the simple network management protocol, the idea is it's this client-server relationship that allows you to remotely connect to an asset and pull information about it that it stores essentially in a little database called a, a MIB. So we see these, especially the most common example is for network switches. So I can connect to a network switch remotely. And so let's say I'm a network administrator. I can connect to that network switch. And then I can go into this database into a specific field or entry that I am looking for to say, oh, okay, let's say this is a 24 port switch. And it can, I can look in the values for those 24 ports to see which ports are active. I can see you know, how much data is being transmitted uh, at that point in time in that port, how much is being received on that port. Uh, we can look for, are there any errors over the last five minutes in that port, right? So on and, and so forth. So SNMP, again, it's a, allows us to store information about that asset, about that system and how it's performing. So it's very similar in control systems where if I connect to a PLC with Modbus, I can see all these different aspects of the system itself. So you might even have a value to say, let's say that PLC controls an asset. Maybe it's that thermostat we have in, in at home or in the office. And that if I look up, let's just say the value in the first slot, just for now, we'll just use some generic terminology. If I look at the first value and I see a one, it means the air conditioner is on. If I see a zero, it means the air conditioner is off. So start thinking about, well, if I can see a zero or a one to then know if the air conditioning is on or off, well, do I have the ability to manipulate the zero and one to be able to churn the air conditioner on or off, even if I'm not a authorized party into being able to control that process. Right? And that's where the security questions come into mind. So, and we'll talk about some other networking tools, but this is much more for, especially when we get into penetration testing course, you know, much more dedicated hours into you know, how do we test security, how do we break into control system networks, but you know, tools like Nmap, but we'll see, we'll see Nmap before the, the course is over. So looking at doing some basic port scans, the Modbus CLI is a client utility that you can use to make connections to Modbus servers to request pieces of information. Uh, Scapy is a tool that allows you to cr kind of basically create your own network packets and anything you can imagine you can put out on the network, whether it's going to work or not. So um, Metasploit is a automated, well, more of a automated attack framework, mostly in the IT world, but it has some OT functionality built into it. So, but it's mostly used to, it makes exploiting vulnerabilities in, IT, let's just say, known ex, uh, vulnerabilities in the IT world very, very easy. Or as easy as it can be. How about that? <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with that. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about Metasploit and maybe we'll see some examples before the, the course is over. Again, the main, main idea is we're going to focus on Modbus, the, the version that runs over TCP IP, and that the default port for Modbus is TCP 502. So if we ever see activity on TCP 502, it's almost always going to be Modbus. Not always. So don't we're not going to always assume it is, but more than likely we'll, we'll think it is. How about that? <laughs> so... Um, now, and this is where we're starting to talk about how Modbus is like SNMP, where it stores information about the asset locally. And so Modbus stores information or data in slots or little placeholders called coils and registers. So if you're familiar with how databases are structured, so we create different fields in the database and we have different sizes or different amounts of data that we can store in these different fields. And that we can read and write to these, these fields, depending on the permissions we have. But if you think, if I'm an engineer that I'm making updates to PL, PLC programming, right? I need to, to have the ability to write. And if I'm 
upgrading the firmware as a as a tech I, I need the ability to write to the system potentially an attacker has the ability ability to remotely manipulate those values remember when we talked about just going to the the first value and changing a zero to one it turns on the air conditioner or changing the one to a zero which turns off the air conditioner you see, they are zero based. So the first one is zero, and then the second one is one, and the third one is two, and so on and so forth. But they talk about so when we store information in coils and registers. So coils store it's a single a bit, right? It's zero one, right? So true, false, on off, right? You when you load that value, you either see a zero or a one. So we'll see those in in Wireshark. Now you can also, if you want to store larger values, like if we go back to our thermostat example, if I'm storing the temperature, then the temperature, let's say it's going to be 80 degrees inside the room. Well, it's a little warm for my taste, but let's say if it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, then I can't store that as a zero or one, right? I need to store, store a larger value. So we need to have a register to be able to do that. And we'll look at some examples. Now there's different Modbus function code. So there's different commands. So you can see the first one, well, read coil. So remember, we can have coils and registers. Coil stores just zeros and ones. And you see all these different variations. We're not gonna get into all of them. We can see, yeah, I can read coils, I can write coils, I can read and I can write to registers. Well, again, we'll see some of these examples and how they look through Wireshark. Now, Modbus, and you can see here, there's some troubleshooting or diagnostic commands. You also see report slave ID, which shows a, a relationship between devices you know, with, with Modbus. So it's based off of a master-slave communication scheme, but we're moving away from that into uh, using the you know, client-server naming convention. So trying to get away from all the the racist connotations. So you're just still, unfortunately, you're still going to see kind of master and slave pop up from, from time to time because it's, you know, it's going to take time to, to get rid of it. Um, now here's an example um, and where we look at, and these are some great free tools. Again, I, I love love showing and, and using free tools. So I, I don't want anybody to ever have to purchase anything when going through a class, but these are examples of different tools that you can use to simulate Modbus. And so here, you know, we have the the Modbus, the server simulator, right? Or you can see it's really simulating a PLC running Modbus. And so it's where it's storing all this information. Now you can see it's not varying the the data, it'll change the data, it'll rotate it, but it's still the same value in all of these memory spaces. So it's it's nothing special from, from that. I think you can also play with it a little bit more if you really want, um, but even just spinning it up and then using the, the polling, the client, it's just a graphical interface. The one we mentioned earlier, um, it's just command line. And it's built into like Kali Linux, if you're familiar with that, especially from a security testing or penetration testing uh, perspective. All right, but you can see in this case, we have the client. You can see in the lower right hand corner of the client, it's connected to the local host and TCP port 502. And that it's pulling the data from those memory spaces inside the host, which is what you're seeing, right? You can see the, the values in the memory or in the database, let's say, on the on the P of the, the simulated PLC, and then we can see those values in the, the client on the right hand side. So you can definitely check those and play it check out those and, and play with those. And again, there are also other free client servers out there. There's there's others that you can pay uh, and they're not too expensive to simulate things like PLCs and and uh, Modbus communication. So it's just something to, to play a little bit with. And it's also one of those, if you're especially doing it over the wire or at least locally where you can capture it with Wireshark. Again, it's an, it allows you to go in those Wireshark captures and understand a little bit better what you're looking at in, in Wireshark. But again, we'll, and we'll look at an example here. 
right? So if we have this idea, remember that the PLC acts as the, the server, right? The, the Modbus server. And then we have the, the Modbus client, which could be like in this case, our engineering workstation that goes and sends out a request to the server, to the PLC, like, oh, okay, what is the value in the first coil in your database? And then yeah, it'll, it'll give us a response as long as we have that connection and that permission. And it's usually pretty, pretty wide open at least in read-only uh, format. Maybe not read-write, hopefully not. And that's where we get into, remember, our key switch. So we want to make sure that we have all of our PCs in run mode, which this one is not. We can see in the picture, right? Because in run mode, it's in read-only. So people can't just manipulate those values remotely and turn a zero to one or a one to a zero. Or maybe we turn the 80 degree set point to 100 degrees or 40 degrees. So crank the heat up all the way or crank the air conditioner up all the way. So again, it acts as this client server where we can issue yeah, different requests, right? Read, write, or any of those diagnostics that, that we have access to. So when we look at this in Wireshark, Here's a bit of a sample, and there's a, definitely a lot more to it. And, and we'll come back and we'll actually open up Wireshark in a second. But what we're seeing is part of the Wireshark window where you can see the packets we've captured. So you can see the number of packets, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And get, this is one of the, the ITI Tim Yardley packet captures. Again, very short, sweet, to the point, very concise, gives us exactly what we're looking for. I can see the, in the packet capture, I can see the source IP address, I can see the destination IP address, so I can see there's two hosts talking to each other, 10.0.0.57 and 10.0.0.3. We can see the protocol, so some of these packets are for TCP IP. This is where we have, uh, it's kind of interesting, those first three packets are actually a previous network session between those hosts being torn down, right? So those hosts were talking with each other and then they wrapped up and they said, okay, we're done talking. That's what you're actually seeing in those, those, those first three packets. Those, those should have been chopped out. The next three, so packets four, five, and six, that's where we're establishing a new, oh, actually, sorry, no. <laughs> so, Packets one through four, that's where those two hosts were talking and then they, they said, hey, we're okay, we're done. So packets five, six, and seven, that's where we see the three-way handshake to establish communication between two computers or assets running TCP IP. So that's where you can see where there's the SYN, SYNAC, and ACK. So we don't get into it here, but that's the three-way handshake that we use to establish a connection between two computers running TCP IP. And not only are we establishing the connection, but we can see the ports in which they're establishing the connection. Now, the source port is not necessarily important. This port of 2578, it's somewhat randomly chosen. What is important is the destination port, which we can see is 502. Remember port 502 and TCP, and we see this is TCP traffic. Port TCP 502 is used for Modbus. So more than likely, this is going to be Modbus traffic, and we see exactly that. So once that TCP connection is established, then all the other traffic going over it is that Modbus over TCP traffic. And then you can start to see, well, what are they sending? Oh, well, we're sending queries, and then we're getting responses. So if we're looking at this, so the source of 10.0.0.57 is sending a query to 10.0.0.3, which is means 10.0.0.3, in this case, is our PLC. And then 10.0.0.57, it could be an engineering workstation, it could be another host on the network, it could be an attacker, or it could be a technician that has authorization, 
We don't know that looking at the packet, right? That's additional context we would need in the case of an investigation. But from the packet capture itself, again, we see the first four packets really are inconsequential. These two hosts were talking with each other. They finished, they wrapped it up, they closed those sessions. That's what we're actually seeing there. Packets five, six, seven, that's where we establish the TCP connection between those two hosts using that three-way handshake. And then everything else is the Modbus traffic. And then Wireshark, remember, using that dissector or the parser, it translates that information into something that, oh, hey, oh, well, what is it asking for? Right, well, what type of response did we get? So we're going to come back and, and look at that. Now, you can also do a filter in Wireshark to say, hey, I don't even care about the TCP IP traffic. Like, I get, I get it, right? The computers, you know, will set up the connection and, hey, these, these four packets where the computers were talking to each other and they closed the connect. I don't care. I just want to see the Modbus traffic. Right? I want to see what's going on, which hosts are talking with Modbus, what types of commands are they issuing, Right? Are they trying to make updates? Right? Are they just reading? What's going on? That's all I want to see. So you can do a filter, like in this case, where we just say show Modbus. And here's the name of the packet. So if you're looking in that ITI repository, you can get the Modbus test data underscore part one. So let's go ahead and open that up now. So let me find our friend Wireshark. And we'll install the update later, like a good cybersecurity professional. <laughs> and then let's find, I think this is the packet capture right here. I hope, let's, let's open it up. And so you can see this is a little bit different where we're seeing the entire Wireshark screen. But this is exactly the packet capture that we were looking at earlier, right? Remember, first four is the, the computers that were talking with each other but are no longer. And then five, six, and seven, those are the packets where they're establishing a new connection to talk. And then we start issuing essentially commands, right? But the idea is, remember, that Wireshark looks at the zeros and ones going over the wire, captures all of them, and then displays it in information that we can understand. Remember, we talked about the OSI models and we had that header information. That's actually what's being displayed in the lower left-hand corner. Now, the right-hand corner is ideally where they're showing the zeros and ones, except if we just showed zeros and ones, it, A, it's meaningless and it just we don't have enough real estate on the screen to be able to display all that. It means nothing. But, so we convert it to hex, so it's a little bit more manageable. But most people don't talk in binary or speak or read in binary, and most don't even speak or talk or read in, in hex. But so in that lower left-hand corner, though, and this is interesting because when you look at that first section, this is actually all the information related to the physical layer, level one. And then as you move up the OSI models, well, the next layer, right, is level two. So that's where we see Ethernet. Right? Remember, that's also where we see the media access control. So we can see the MAC address, right, the media access control address of the network cards or interfaces that are talking to each other. We can, oh, and I should note that the first half of that 48-bit address, right? So these are 48 bits addresses in hex. The first half is actually mapped to the vendor. So the IEEE maintains a database. So anybody that manufactures a network card, they actually register or they'll get a range of addresses assigned to them. So that's why you can see Wireshark is saying, hey, if your MAC address starts with 0002B3, that means the manufacturer of that interface card is Intel. Or if your MAC address starts with 002078, then, oh, that network interface was created by this company called Runtop. So it can 
help us identify different assets in the environment. Also, if I'm an, an attacker, it can help us identify different assets in the environment. But just keep that in mind. We'll see some better examples on where that can come in handy a little, little bit later. But remember, each of these maps to the different layers of the OSI model. So remember layer one, the physical layer, layer two, the physical, or the, sorry, the, the data link layer where we have the Mac sub layer where we see the, the, the Mac addresses, which is exactly what we see here. Now the network layer, remember that's where IP works. So that's where we see things like IP addresses. So this is where we can see, yeah, 10.0.0.57 is talking with 10.0.0.3. And you can click into each of these and there's even more information, but I think the highlights are kind of what we're seeing here. And then remember layer four, that's the transport layer. So that's where TCP and UDP, UDP take place and where are the, the ports that we connect to operate with or, or take place. And then again, we can see sure the source port of 2387 can not as meaningful. What we're really looking for is the destination port and we see TCP 502. So then we can more than likely, especially in this scenario, it's going to be Modbus. So we know there's a Modbus server or Modbus endpoint there. Right. So that's what we're seeing in Wireshark. And then again, if we want to just limit it to Modbus traffic, we can put a filter in, say, yeah, just show me Modbus. Get rid of all the gen generic TCP IP information. I, I just don't care. I don't need, it's not going to help me. And that's, that's kind of looking at Wireshark, you know, just to get it up and running. Now, there's some other things that we can look at. So what happens when we start digging into these requests and the responses that we're, we're seeing? So we'll look at one of these real quickly so we can jump down like to packet 51 here. Now it's interesting also because now there's a third host in the packet capture because now we're also seeing 10.0.09 and 10.0.0.1. And so we can look to see if we expand down here under Modbus and Modbus TCP IP, right, we can actually see that, okay, we know that 10.0.0.9 is issuing a query for recoil. So it wants to say, okay, give us a coil. I'm going to read the first coil, which is number zero. And I'm only going to get a single coil. So I'm going to get then when I do the response, right, we're going to go ahead and, oh, okay, the PLC in this case is going to look up to see what is the value in that first slot. And it's going to send that value back and say, yeah, the value, it's zero. Remember, a coil can only store a zero or a one. So we're expecting a zero or a one. So we issue the query to say, okay, what's the value in the first coil, essentially? I'm kind of shortcutting it, but yeah, we're just saying, what's the value in the first coil? And then the PLC is coming back and saying, okay, the value is zero. So again, maybe in that case, that means the air conditioner is off. So if I can read the coil, again, this is where the attackers get stuck, right? Because if I'm able to see zeros and ones, I don't know what that's, what does a zero mean for that first slot? That first slot, it might actually be completely meaningless. We don't know. That's where, oh, if I'm an attacker, if I have things to access like your program files or your program data or process data, or I'm on your engineering workstation and I can use that information to reverse engineer, right? What's happening in the environment, right? That's, that's a possibility. And then as we go through the capture, this is where, oh, we see all these recommits, but oh, now we see right. Again, this could be a completely legitimate user that's issuing these write commands. But what if it is an attacker? How would we know? Right? That's a really big question we'll come back and talk about in the last part of the course, right? When we get into network security monitoring, when we detect anomalies, right? Going through the investigation process to determine is this something bad happening in the environment? And so in this case, we can see that they want to go ahead 
and update a value in one of those coils. And then you can see, well, what are you going to update it to? Right, so I want to change that zero to a one or a one to a zero. That's where we're really kind of going through in, in this example. So we kind of walk through these. So we'll just go ahead and skip through these. Oh, and you can, and this is referencing where you don't have to pull one register or one coil at a time. You can actually say, hey, give me the next 10 coils or the next 10 registers. Right, you don't have to just do one at a time, which makes it nice. But, um, so we go through there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I actually had a different, <laughs> I thought I had a different example in here. So I'll, I'll have to come back and, and add that into uh, uh, the later part of the, the section. But, so that's a real quick high level uh, look at Modbus. We'll come back and, and look at some other examples as well. If you want to really look into some Modbus labs, um, David, oh, his last name is escaping me, but he has a company called Fortified with a P-H-Y-D, remember, if I remember right. And he actually has some amazing, amazing labs uh, where it sets up like, um, it's kind of like where you're watching like a power plant and a chemical refinery and different environments like through a webcam. And then you're able to manipulate different values on the control system as like the PLCs to see if you can create some type of dangerous condition where you can actually watch like things like the power plant catch on fire, <laughs> right? Or, or a chemical refinery start to smoke. Um, so it's, it simulates, right? The, the real world type of uh, attacks in a, in a really cool fashion. And he mentioned he got some money from the Air Force, I think, to build them out. So really, uh, really awesome work. Um, and you can, somebody had pointed out when I did this course uh, live that he made them available, at least the original versions, uh, on uh, GitHub, which is very, very cool. Um, so you can actually just download and, and implement it. In fact, actually, let's just find it. Uh, real quick, you can see my LinkedIn feed, <laughs> but um, we'll do GitHub. I think it's F O four to five, like that. Yeah, I think this. Um, I think this fortified logic. Yes, I think this is so OT security with OT logic. Yeah, I think he also has a new project for uh, associated with secure PLC coding. I think he was down at the, the recent conference in Atlanta talking about that. Um, here's a graphical realism framework for industrial control. I don't. Mm. OK, yeah. So it looks like and these are the, the simulations. Yeah. So you can see where you can set up like a, a software based version of a PLC and HMI or firewall and so on. You can also purchase access to his online labs and they're updated. Um, um, and I think you get access for like six months. I took his class that he taught at Besides Augusta. And so you get like six months of, of access. So it's very cool stuff. Um, I said I was really impressed um, with the, the labs. They're David Formby, that's 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 his name, Kim. Um, so yeah, really nice guy. Um, I think he had got into this and when he was doing his PhD work um, and has really just you know taken off and run with it um, since. So so definitely check those out if you have the time and and the want. And I'll probably be doing some demos of that. Um, down the road uh, sometime, but but not probably as part of this this course. But definitely check check that out. So I'm going to pull myself back a little bit before I go too far off the rails, <laughs> and we can talk about some of the other industrial control protocols. We'll 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 be definitely referencing some of these additional ones as we go throughout the course, uh, even some that that aren't aren't actually listed in this section, like BACnet's not here. BACnet's used in building automation systems. So that's one probably that is gonna be more common for people, especially even IT to come across. But so S7 is a proprietary protocol from Siemens. So if you have Siemens in your environment, it can be talking S7, just like with Modbus, it can run on its own, but more than likely you're gonna see it running over TCP IP these days. 
uh, very similar to Modbus. It you know allows you to read values, write values, issue commands for things like troubleshooting. So this is what it looks like from the Wireshark perspective. Now, the one kicker with this example, when I started looking at them, the first thing that jumped out is the IEP addresses, because if you look at the IEP addresses, these are public IP addresses. These are hosts on the internet. Right? These are not internal IP addresses. They're not private IP addresses. So this would, as you imagine, would indicate this is traffic over the internet, which that's more than likely, right? Now you can actually use public IP addresses internally and still have it private, but on the surface, this would look like two hosts communicating over the internet, which we never want our OT assets exposed to the internet, not directly, because that's going to leave them open and vulnerable to attack, right? Uh, but this is what it looks like through Wireshark. So okay, it's very similar. In this case, you can see um, it's not reading writing functions. It's it's oh okay. I want tell me what the the time is on that PLC. And then you can see the next set. If we kind of go back, get rid of the arrows, right? It's not only read the clock, but oh set the clock. So what if maybe an attacker could change the value of the clock or the time or the date, right? That's that's, that can literally be potentially dangerous in an OT network. If not, if anything, it's just going to potentially break your process. So, and then there you can see um, Wireshark, right? Deciphering with the dissector the the information for S7. I mentioned OPC. This is the one that's based off of the object linking, and I, st I still can't say this without laughing because it's like, oh my gosh, you did what? Um, I, I still can't believe this to today it's still kind of funny now the newer version of opc ua is a modern open source protocol um, uses kind of client client server model there's also a publish subscribe um, there's other protocols that support so you can see tcp udp we're also going to come back and talk about mqtt um, not really the others and not in this course but we will talk about mqtt as a messaging protocol as well you can see it actually has security features where with the original version of opc there were no security features. I think the one key between OPC and OPC UPA, they're completely different protocols, though. There's no connection other than they come from, uh, oh, I don't have the picture anymore, the OPC uh, foundation folks. So, um, and then, again, there's there's a lot of others that we're going to talk about. So I mentioned BACnet. Uh, we'll, we'll, again, we'll talk about BACnet a little bit. We'll talk about DMP3 a little bit. Um, we'll talk a little bit about PC Works, Omron, Codesys. Codesys we'll definitely be talking about. Um, and um, there's a lot more to the, the Codesys conversation there, where it's more than just this idea of a protocol. But so, so those are definitely some we'll talk about. And the, the list goes on and on. We'll even talk about more when we get into the Shodan section. So it should be Unit 7 or Part 7 when we get down there. Um, so we'll see some more there. But... And then there's also, again, the wireless protocols. So we'll come back and, and see some examples later on in the course about different wireless communication. Remember, wireless can be anything. In the IT world, when we say wireless, we're just usually talking about 802.11, maybe Bluetooth, maybe like near-field communication for like badge readers uh, to open up doors. But in the OT world, we can have lots of different types of wireless communication, RF, like radio, radio frequency, Zigbee, again, wireless hard. Those are some of the ones that I'm more familiar with because I see those more in environments. But you also, you also see 802.11 everywhere in, in control system environments, which again is very dangerous because Wi-Fi inherently is not, not safe. It's not secure, and it's it's hard to secure, especially in OT environments. And so we're leaving these environments open to to attack. But we'll come back and, and we'll talk about that uh, hardening, especially when we get into things like secure network architecture, and a little bit later on. And yeah, how what what are we doing with with wireless protocols and and how we're going to secure those. So we kind of ran through a lot there. I know that's a lot of information, but we talked about different types of control systems, and then we got into different control protocols. Again, the main one we're focused on is Modbus over 
TCP IP because that's the one we're going to see everywhere. I think it's, it's also makes some for some fairly straightforward examples. But again, we'll come back and and we'll talk through some more of those examples. We didn't get too far in the weeds. I think we just wanted to kind of hit it at a high level and then we'll come back and start digging it a little little bit deeper. So and that's that's the end of this part. So and we'll uh, come back in the next section is where we really start to talk about, OK, how do we secure our networks? And this is where I also like because we're also talking about, well, how do we secure them? Well, well, what are we securing them from? Right? So what are the different types of attacks? So that's that's what we're going to going to be able to see. So I think, yeah, with that, that's that's the part. So thanks again for watching. If you liked it, if you can like it on YouTube, and, and if you haven't already subscribed, I appreciate it if you do. Uh, otherwise, then I will see you in part four. Thanks again for checking it out.